Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ohio 4-H 2020 Fall Showcase. We are grateful and honored that you have taken the time to be with us this afternoon. I am Elizabeth Thomas. It is my privilege to serve as the Ohio 4-H Foundation Board President. It is my pleasure to be here with you as we showcase the innovative methods Ohio 4-H has used to imp implement new programming during this challenging year. We highly encourage you to use the chat function to share with us who is joining us this afternoon and also to provide positive kudos to our presenters. Another note, this session is being recorded and will be shared to you via email within one week from today. Before I introduce our first speaker, I do want to acknowledge and appreciate individuals who are joining us this afternoon. Jackie Kirby Wilkins, our Interim Director for the Ohio State University Extension is here with us today. And also Kirk Bloor, our State 4-H leader. Hearing from Kirk later in this program. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the Vice President for Agricultural Administration and Dean of our College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Kath Ann Kress, to give a few remarks. Dr. Kress. Elizabeth, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to be here with all of you. And uh, to everyone joining us, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here today to help us celebrate the spirit of 4-H and our young people. As we get started, I ask you to join me and take a moment of reflection to commemorate the significance of 9-11 and how clearly it focused us as a country on the importance of our connections, our communities, our country, and our world, the very things we consistently raise up each time any of us recites our 4-H pledge. It's an understatement to say that this year has brought us many unexpected changes and often unwelcome decisions. It's generated challenges which hit at the fundamental level of what we believe is important as a community, such as creating our spaces for belonging, fostering relationships, those opportunities for learning and mastery and service. Throughout this year, our 4-H educators and our 4-H volunteers with the leadership of Kirk Bloor have maintained their vision and their dedication. They've been creative, flexible, and determined to retain the core of a 4-H experience. Thank you all for doing that. We've tried some new methods and you're gonna get to hear about them today, but we are still focused on positive youth development and enriching educational experiences, which we believe will continue to ensure that 4-H programs are even stronger in the future. At CFAES and 4-H, we don't do anything alone, and our partners make much of what we're able to do possible. I wanna thank our generous donors and supporters who share our commitment to our youth. Throughout our college portfolio, our people have demonstrated great resilience. We entered this pandemic in a strong position in every area, financially, strategically, and programmatically. That strength has proven critical in ensuring our stability and innovation, even during our current conditions. This is true throughout our college, in our undergraduate and graduate programs, at ATI, in our research enterprise throughout the state, our extension programs, including 4-H. We have continuing aspirations for 4-H, which we've already shared with our new president, President Johnson. We wanna to continue to welcome youth in a positive youth development experience, and also have it be their first class at The Ohio State University. Thank you again for joining us today, and thank you for continuing to make 4-H possible. Thank you, Dean Kress. 
We appreciate your support and joining us this afternoon. At this time, we are privileged to have with us 4-H professionals around the state to share some of the innovative programming they have been working on this year. We are going to hear from two separate groups this afternoon sharing about 4-H camps and, and spin clubs. We allow time for questions at the end, so feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So let's get started. Let's welcome Kayla Oberstadt, 4-H Program Manager, and Jamie McConnell, 4-H Educator in Muskingum County. They're going to talk to us about virtual 4-H camp. Take it away, Kayla and Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Jamie McConnell. I'm the 4-H educator in Muskingum County, and our office is located in downtown Saintsville. And my name is Kayla Oberstadt. I am proud to be a 4-H program manager with Older Youth Leadership and Ohio Military Kids, based out of our state 4-H office located on the campus in Columbus. In 2020, I had the opportunity to serve as the chair of the State 4-H Camping Design Team. Our Camping Design Team is a group of 4-H professionals from around the state and some folks from the State 4-H office who are, are particularly passionate about 4-H. We meet throughout the year and we do things like develop camp counselor training curriculum and resources, uh, evaluate the impacts of 4-H camp and plan professional development opportunities for our colleagues to make Ohio 4-H camping the best that it possibly can be. Going back to April, uh, April 7th of 2020, which is a day that I think will stick in the minds of many of us for a long time to come, that was the day that the statewide announcement was made that 4-H camps would be canceled face-to-face uh, -face for 2020. And I know for me, there were tears. Um, there was a long walk on my farm to try to clear my head and think about what happens next. Um, amidst that sadness, I I'm proud to say that the camping design team felt uh, a pretty immediate call to action uh, with the support and encouragement of Dr. Hannah Epley, our state camping specialist and an interim associate state leader to make sure that uh, summer without in-person 4-H camps didn't mean that our summer wouldn't celebrate the spirit of what 4-H camp is all about. So we quickly got to work. We divided ourselves into two committees. There was a group that worked on a statewide camp, which you're going to hear about from Kayla as well as some of, some of the other statewide efforts here shortly. And there were a group of us that I was included in that group that worked on developing some guidelines for how professionals around the state could offer an opportunity if they wanted to at the county level. So we felt strongly that, that the pandemic presented us with an opportunity to not see camp um, go quietly into the night, but to rise up, to persevere, and to ensure that we had an opportunity to bring camp into the homes of our 4-H families and volunteers and, and even some non-4-H members um, throughout 2020. And I, and I have to say that uh, looking at the, the year that we've had, I'm so very proud to be a part of it. I'm inspired by the way that our team um, stepped up, the way that our colleagues took on the challenge, and the way that even our camp counselors and staff volunteers um, rose up with us to meet this challenge. And with that, I'm excited to share with you a video that Kayla Oberstadt actually put together for us um, to highlight some of the things that happened during vir virtual 4-H camps in 2020.
Uh, I'm going to say a motion with the sport, uh, and then we are all going to do that together and act that out. All right, now we're going to play a little tennis. Everyone needs a racket in their hand. Here we go, racket in their hand, and go. And hold up your trophies. Woo! Good job, everyone. Good job. All right, bring it back together. Bring it back together. Yeah. One, two, three. Row me over the ocean. ocean. to do it that we still got to do it even though we're at home so thank you Thank you for enjoying that video. It is shared on YouTube if anyone would like to be able to let others know of our positive outcomes from virtual camps and other opportunities that we did. Obviously not being at camp, but bringing camp to your homes. And as Jamie mentioned, she will describe those county-based opportunities. And I'm gonna go into depth about the statewide camps that we offered for our young people across the state of Ohio. So first off, we have an overview of the statewide camps, which included a statewide youth population of ages eight through 18 for what we called Ohio 4-H camp-ish. And the other camp that was statewide was for Ohio military kids. Each of these camps was three days long and offered sessions that were one to two hour segments offered roughly three times a day. There is a screenshot of one of our camp agendas there on the right hand side of the screen and it shows how we broke down having activities in the morning, in the afternoon, and then in the evening. There were daily themes as well and what we had was throughout both of these statewide camps plenty of staff um, support and assistance. So between um, the campish program we had 30 professionals from our 4-H staff across the state assisting with programming. For statewide leadership camp, this was more specific to our teen audience. Leadership camp is typically a selected group of young people, 14 to 18 in age, who are nominated or selected by their counties as what is expected to be a once in a 4-H career opportunity. So knowing that these are teenagers facing a summer without camps, a summer without being camp counselors or being in person in some of those venues that they have grown up in, we wanted to make sure that teen leaders still had an opportunity to learn and grow with one another. So Leadership Camp also offered three days of programming. Our sessions were two to three hours long, simply because they're teenagers, we could offer a little bit more time, and the activities were a bit more structured than what you would find at a traditional camp. Instead of our five days of the typical programming at 4-H Camp Ohio, as I said, we had three days, but we still covered the six pillars of leadership typically offered for leadership camp, which includes motivation, trust, discipline, understanding self and others, planning an initiative, and this time, instead of doing courage, because we couldn't have a high ropes course virtually, we did the pillar of communication. So given that, we wanna make sure that these young people who attended this past summer for teen leadership camp, if they are still eligible in 4-H next year and our opportunities allow, we'd love to invite them to in-person leadership camp next summer. You can see that we also had staff involved for this program, 4-H professionals, 4-H volunteers as instructors, 
and our camp counselors. We encourage that involvement from recent 4-H alumni who volunteered their time as college students or recent grads to come back and support our teenage campers. So moving back to our, our larger statewide camps, such as Campish and the Ohio Military Kids Camps, we had a great opportunity to bring in a variety of components that might not have been offered in a typical in-person camp setting that allowed some extra special guests that based on travel or time zones wouldn't have been able to be in person at one of our camps, but we could have them virtually. So we thank the Next Gen Agricultural Ambassadors who hosted activities such as an egg drop challenge for campers to be able to create and engineer um, a device that would catch an egg and not allow it to break. We also had plenty of activities taught by our 4-H extension educators, such as craft opportunities, recreation, and you see some photos here as well that show what they were up to. But of special regard, and given that today is September 11th as we're reflecting, we had a special camp flag ceremony hosted at Leadership Camp that was brought to us from Italy. One of our Ohio 4-H alumni from Allen County serves as a National Guards member and she is currently stationed in Italy and continues to come back each summer to serve at Ohio Military Kids Camp and was able to offer a very touching and excellent opportunity for our teen leadership campers to connect with the flag and the meaning of that leadership they're learning in 4-H. So as you see those activities and challenges that were offered at home, we encouraged parents and family members to take photos. They could submit this to an online portal or Dropbox, and then we could share them back in a PowerPoint slide. So like the photos you are seeing here, they were truly sent to us from parents while their kids were enjoying camp. Looking at the statistics of how many campers we reached during these state-based opportunities includes 276 campers over the three days of Campish. And we had 53 campers who are all military affiliated youth join us for the virtual military kids camp. These again were two separate weeks of programming. We had 58 different counties represented for our virtual campish and even a few campers from different states who learned about our programs. Of those 276 campers who joined us for virtual campish, 42 youth who are not already 4-H members participated and we hope that those 42 as well as any of their friends will join us in Ohio 4-H in the future. The primary age groups that attended that were ages 8 to 13, although the camp was open to age 18. For leadership camp, as I said, this was a nominated or selected process. These campers uh, were a total population of 21 teenagers from across the state of Ohio. Of course, we have to do an evaluation. Even though it's not in person, we would love to know what it is that our campers enjoyed and what we could do better hoping that we're not having to do virtual experiences for long into the future, but we're aware that their input will really help us create better services in the future. So one of those pieces that we heard from one of our young people is that a hearing impaired camper was able to attend virtually when the limitations of being in a large outdoor setting would not have allowed them the best experience because of their hearing impairment. So that was really positive to know that they enjoyed camp and now because of their participation, can see themselves at camp in the future and know how we can accommodate for their needs. We also learned that first time campers were more comfortable attending camp in their own home and seeing positive faces of staff and other campers that they want to come back now next year. So from what we have learned at virtual camp, we expect to incorporate these additional accessibilities in future in-person camps. Here you see a chart. It's pretty simple. Did the campers have fun? Their responses were strongly agree and agree. While it might not have been what they intended to be able to be around a campfire or sharing a cabin with their friends, they had fun because we could bring that spirit of connection to them virtually. Our goals were met to make sure that not only were campers receiving a safe and educational online experience, but they still had fun 
even though they weren't at that camp location. And our overall rating of Campish, given that it was early in June, it was one of the first statewide virtual activities that we offered, our goals were met. We wanted to make sure that not only were campers receiving a safe and educational experience, we know they had fun. We're happy to see those outcomes and how they rated our virtual camp. And as anyone can guess, we hope to be back in our real camp soon. So given the results of some open-ended questions from the evaluation of our campers, we asked, what else can Ohio 4-H offer you virtually? This list was entered from those campers or perhaps their parents. And as you can see those requests, one of those is spin clubs. We'll get to hear from our colleagues, Tony and Sue shortly to tell us a little bit about the impact and outcomes that spin clubs have offered our 4-H members across the state. But before we get to them, I'm turning it over to my friend and colleague, Jamie McConnell, so that she can share information about the county-based specific camp programs that were offered this summer. Thanks, Kayla. So what we know about county specific programs that happened um, around virtual camping, there were at least 15 counties that offered some sort of virtual camping opportunity. And there was a wide variety of delivery methods. I know in, in Muskingum County, we did something very similar to Campish on a little bit smaller scale and did live Zoom meetings. That photo that you see there on the right is a member from Muskingum County who submitted a picture of an activity that they actually did in advance of camp and had the opportunity to share when we were on a live meeting. They folks did pre-recorded videos. Some counties utilized their county existing county Facebook pages. Others created specific private groups. There were counties that did camping challenges, utilized our, our blog opportunity that we have through the university and some counties that did camp in, the, in a box. And I'll share some specific examples um, from different counties over the next few slides. Ross County there on the left, that was an example of a, a county that during their week of camp, they had several pre-recorded videos that they shared of camp counselors and staff doing different activities or challenging families to participate in different activities that you would traditionally see at camp. They have more than 3,000 fans on their uh, county Facebook page. So they had an opportunity to not only reach their camp families, but camp alumni and folks to just uh, keep the spirit of camp going during that time. Wayne County hosted three different virtual camping opportunities and they actually utilized uh, closed Facebook groups so the families could join in there and they, they shared the materials there. They did a junior camp and they did two topic specific camps, a, a sewing camp and a food and nutrition camp. In Muskingum County, we there on the left, you'll see um, a picture of our what we called camp at home challenge. This was new for us. We issued a challenge to our 4-H families and we had eight take advantage of that. Basically they were challenged to camp outside at their home on a property that they owned for at least one night. Um, those that entered were entered to win scholarships. We actually gave away some scholarships to our 2021 camp. Uh, the particular family that you see in those photos is the Bradley family. They live um, in New Concord, Ohio, and they actually took it to a totally different degree than what we had expected. They planned an at-home camp that was five days and four nights. They had campfire, crafts, creaking, they even had zip lines at their house that they had gotten for Christmas. So they really uh, took advantage of the opportunity. And one of the really neat things um, as the educator in that county to see happen was parents who had been camp counselors had the opportunity to relive some of those camp traditions, share their memories of camp. Um, so it was a really good opportunity for our families um, to camp together. And then uh, on the right there, you'll see an example Fairfield County did a camp called Quarantine in Space, and they actually used the u.osu.edu blog format to share what they called their daily missions that they challenged campers to participate in throughout their camp. Um, camp Palmer actually is not a county camp, obviously. They're one of our camping facilities, but they had a very, very successful program that they called Camp in a Box, where folks could pay 
to purchase a box that had a t-shirt, some different activities, and, and many other things in them. Those were sent out and they were very successful, not only in having um, more than three, I think it was about 350 boxes that were sold. It was a, a good fundraiser for Camp Palmer as well. Um, Perry County was a, a county level that did a camp in a box and they offered uh, kids an opportunity if they chose to, to also log into some live Zoom sessions to participate with doing the activities from the box as with the camp counselors if they wanted to. So there were a lot of counties that did some hybrid things as well. And, and the last project I would like to share is uh, again out of Ross County. So the Ross County Camp Counselors, they designed a COVID-19 t-shirt that was sold statewide. We don't have the final numbers on this yet, but $3 of each t-shirt sold went to the camping facility that was designated by the person who purchased it. But the thing I really wanted to highlight um, is there on the back of the t-shirt, that image on the right. And it says, tough times don't last, tough people do, and camp spirit too. And I think one of the things that we found in 2020 amongst our, our disappointment that we couldn't go to our, our camping facilities is that the love for camp extends beyond uh, being physically present at those camping facilities, the opportunity to have these virtual camps, but then to see the community support that we experienced through our Camp, Ohio, for Camp Ohio's, or Ohio 4-H Camp's Buckeye Funder project. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Crystal Ott, who's the 4-H Foundation Manager, and she will share with you about the, Camp Ohio, the 4-H Camp's Buckeye Funder. Thank you, Jamie. As you all just saw, as we know, 4-H Camp's this past summer couldn't have their usual experience. And because of that, that put a financial hardship on many of them. So this summer we launched a campaign to raise those funds to help keep those camping facilities going uh, through this very challenging time. So we want to again thank you so much to our 4-H community for coming together to help uh, with this 4-H Camp Buckeye Funder project. So thanks to many of you, it was very successful and we were actually able to raise over uh, the number there on the screen, $177,498 so far. The breakdown there on the screen is of the various camps. The money given to this project helped pay camp utilities, payroll, insurance, and the various operational expenses for these camps to survive the summer. So although summer is over and maybe 4-H camp is not top of mind anymore, uh, these camps still do need our support to maintain their facilities through the winter with the hopes of being able to camp in the future. So if you're still able to donate, we would love for you to do so. The platform there on the screen um, is the website that you can go to and we'll also put that in the chat box for you. Please visit there and share that with others. Thank you so much for all that you've done to help support our camps. Thank you, Crystal. Next, let's introduce Sue Hogan, Franklin County 4-H educator, and Tony Staubach, 4-H educator in Hamilton County. Tony and Sue. Good afternoon. We're excited to be with you uh, here today to talk about 4-H spin clubs. I am the one of the 4-H educators in Franklin County, and our office is located at Waterman. Um, and Tony, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Tony Sabak. Um, I am the Extension Educator for H Youth Development with OSU Extension in Hamilton County, and that's in Cincinnati for those of you who don't know where all of the counties in Ohio are. So uh, you've heard the term spin club mentioned several times today, and you're probably wondering what that is. Well, spin actually comes from Special Interest 4-H Club, and that's the SP and the IN in special interest to, uh, combines into spin. And actually they're nationwide. Uh, in some states they are called Discover. In Utah they're Discover Clubs. I know New Jersey has started a new program and theirs are Step Clubs. But there are also many who just use the term spin. So what is that exactly? Well, you can see here on your screen that it's a very short term program. Um, it explores a, a specific topic. It could be anything, rocketry, gardening, whatever the case may be. It, meets for a minimum of six hours, and that's usually spread out over a time period. In general, they would probably go no more than 10 hours uh, total for the spin club. 
Again, they're short term and they could be virtual or in person. And the youth actually, act, actually work on a project with the presenter. It isn't necessarily a 4-H project. It could be um, something, the curriculum can be designed uh, around uh, many uh, things, uh, a knowledge of a presenter or whatever the case may be. But um, you can use 4-H uh, project books as well. And members, and this is very important, members are 4-Hers. So there are a lot of positive outcomes uh, to the spin clubs. It is a very effective way to involve youth and adults who maybe don't have the, the time to be in a community club, but they want to be a part of 4-H. So, you know, maybe travel's a barrier or uh, adults work and can't get their youth to a 4-H club. So it's really great for folks like myself who work in the urban core um, and want to bring 4-H to others. And it also works great in rural areas as well. Um, most importantly, I think it does introduce 4-H to those new audiences. And right now we have a goal of uh, to meet a one in five by 2025 goal uh, to have youth impacted by 4-H uh, with it by 2025. And I firmly believe that the spin clubs are one way to do that. Now, um, virtual spin clubs I discovered this summer also offer a lot of team building opportunities, not just, you know, with the youth who are involved and get to see other youth maybe around the state um, from other uh, states. And also we've had some from other countries attend some of the virtual spin clubs. So also with my 4-H colleagues, um, and other uh, presenters that we've had, I feel like I've really built a network virtually. So yes, we do like to have our in-person things, but in the virtual world, that works very well for some people. They're very comfortable in that world. So I think it just gives us another tool in our 4-H toolbox. Uh, one of the great things is, as I mentioned briefly, is new partners can be involved. And so, here, we can actually talk about that 4-H spin clubs enhance community clubs. So some of our partners are 4-Hers and 4-H volunteers. In this particular instance, um, you can see in the picture there that youth are um, being introduced to poultry. And that is a 4-H member who, uh, and a 4-H volunteer who have brought that, those uh, animals in. And that was an, actually an animals and agriculture spin club. For, so for six weeks, uh, different 4-H um, volunteers and members brought in a different animal. And it was really a win-win for both. This was actually at a homeless um, center for youth. And it gave the opportunity for our 4-H members to, it was very close to the fair, and it gave them, an, this young woman in particular, an opportunity to practice what she would actually talk about at, at her fair judging. So it has all those mentoring, teaching, um, knowledge acquisition, an opportunity to work with other audiences and service learning as well. So it really is a nice complement to our 4-H community clubs. So getting a 4-H spin club off the ground. Well, we were very fortunate this year. Um, our administrators and particularly uh, Kirk Bloor and Hannah Epley worked with us to um, start a 4-H spin club working group. And Jeff Dick actually led that group. Um, and there were a number of 4-H professionals on the team. And we determined how that might look, what is the definition, and we created materials for our 4-H professionals to use. So I'd like to talk about an in-person spin club that I piloted and then implemented uh, since 2014. And that is the In the Garden Spin Club. So I created a curriculum and then um, came, the thought came to me that we have over 300 Master Gardener volunteers in our Franklin County program. And many of them are former teachers. So I reached out and asked if any of them would like to teach an eight week spin club one hour a week, and it would be to youth in the urban core area in particular. So um, that program turned out to be so successful. We have about five every year that um, we have continued since 2014 uh, every summer with a little uh, alteration this year. 
So the reason gardening is because there is a lot of solid research about how gardening um, can, can bring about positive um, changes in both youth and adults. And the other thing is we have a lot of new Americans here in the Columbus area, Somali and, and other areas of Africa and, and uh, Latino, Lat, Latina audiences. So we really thought that gardeners speak a common language. So youth don't always have to feel so intimidated if they don't know the language. Gardening is a very visual activity. And so they can feel apart and not feel isolated. And these are just a few views of uh, some of the other spin club. One of the, in the bottom right, one of the activities is making salsa towards the end and the kids naturally love eating the salsa. And on the top right, um, we have, uh, this is exciting. It's our oldest community garden in um, Franklin County. It's in Grandview. And they, we have a spin club there as well. So this year definitely threw us for a curveball. We had to figure out how to educate in a virtual world very quickly. And I want to say that our 4-H professionals were amazing. They really stepped up to the plate and created all kinds of interesting spin clubs. I will talk about those um, individually in a, in a second here. And um, also, uh, we developed some folks volunteered to be on 4-H project book teams where we adapted the project books um, to spin club format. So just going through these very slowly, um, there, your thoughts matter. That was an amazing one, which had a large um, attendance. Uh, navigating mental health, which is such an important topic for our youth. And that was an extremely successful spin club. Um, our educator in the Toledo, he did a number of virtual field trips that were also fun. Um, Tony's going to talk about his uh, investigating electricity spin club. It was virtual and so he'll give us a perspective on what it's really like to give um, present a virtual spin club. We also had a career ready and money ready one, so necessary for our youth. And I should say these were happening all over the state and, and many professionals, as I mentioned, teamed up to prevent that, present them. And here's our small garden one. Uh, this Polar Spin Club um, was actually a collaboration I had with Bird Polar and Rutgers and other folks around the country. And it was supposed to be in person here. Um, but what happened with COVID is we created a virtual uh, platform for it. And the exciting thing is Bird Polar, of course, is climate change and they uh, go to polar regions and collect ice cores and all kind of interesting scientific things. And so in this spin club, three uh, polar scientists actually presented on different days and they were from Siberia, Alaska, and Antarctica. And I think it was really exciting for the, the youth involved. Uh, we have 4-H world changers and coding um, with girls is extremely important. Um, they don't always go into those careers, so we want to encourage that. And I know there was another uh, flyer here coming up that's also related to um, computers. So a very important topic for our youth. We have careers in fashion. We had a, a design, home design, which was based on our home living projects. Um, there's one coming up, an environmental awareness one on water quality. So important in our agricultural world. The poultry spin club was extremely popular. And we had an upcycle one in the Cleveland area. And lastly, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but just to give you an idea of the diversity of spin clubs was let's start cooking. And I do know that one of our educators actually um, has a cooking uh, program with um, special needs youth. 
So what an amazing array of things. We're, we're so proud of our educators and, and other 4-H professionals. So next up, Tony is going to talk to you about 4-H in the virtual world and, and a program he started. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Um, I love working with our youth, but working with professionals like Sue Hogan, it just makes my job a lot more fun. Like, I find her passion really inspiring, and I just have to say that because she's so great. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with the Spin Club work group for what feels like forever now, um, especially as we've transitioned to this, this virtual world. Um, but last spring, I met with my advisory committee in Hamilton County and a few key volunteers, and I asked them how they could help me take up the charge of engaging our youth virtually. And Dean Reddick, who is pictured down here on the bottom right, um, from a screenshot from one of our sessions, uh, he's the advisor for our Madeira 4-H club, uh, again, in Hamilton County. Uh, he ripped the torch out of my hand, and he said, I'm an electrical engineer, and I'm going to do an investigating electricity spin club, so you need to make that happen. So we sat down, and we talked about the realities of doing um, an electricity spin club <laughs> virtually, how we could do that. Um, this was early on when we still didn't have all of the answers, and we were really kind of confused about how we were going to get resources in the hands of the kids, um, how we were going to be able to enroll everyone. So this was really an early, an early attempt. And so what we ended up doing is we created that uh, purchase list on Amazon and told the kids it was a free club, but they had to go buy their supplies, and they all went on and ordered that list. Um, they put it in their shopping carts and got the supplies they needed, which worked out really well. Um, Dean has quite a passion for working with our youth, and his favorite thing is direct education. Um, he spends his days, like I said, as an electrical engineer. So he loves in his club meetings when he gets to demonstrate and engage with the youth, and he was really missing that opportunity. And so he ripped the project book apart, and he looked at all different projects and said, these are the ones we can do virtually. These are the ones that build into the next lesson. This is what builds into you know, the next level in the electricity project series. And so it was really, a powerful experience to sit down with him virtually and create this virtual program that our youth could engage in. Um, he did have about 15 kids sign up and about 10 of them finished the project with him, which was, which was great given it was our first attempt. Um, and he was just a real joy to work with on this and I, I really appreciated all of his excitement and energy around engaging youth in electrical education. Um, I personally have a passion for people understanding how electricity works because um, I once had to rewire a whole house that was messed up, and I actually learned how to do that through a 4-H project book, so that was pretty cool. So next I'm going to talk about our Innovative Environmental Leadership Spin Club. And this was something I did in partnership with uh, my colleagues Emily Cars um, in Butler County and Rebecca Stupinger in Greene County. Um, for a number of years, I've done environmental education programs with our public schools in Hamilton County um, around environmental science and environmental justice. And so we decided to take a lot of those lessons and develop a new opportunity on developing um, those important leadership skills through the lens of environmental science, environmental justice, environmental policy, and environmental advocacy. So youth were inspired initially by leaders of the past, and they were also inspired by the youth leaders in the field of environmental justice today, so including people like Greta Thunberg. Um, so we hosted six weekly one-hour sessions and provided direct instruction during those sessions and synthesis of information that the youth engaged with outside of the meeting. So in this particular club, the youth were older and they were given homework assignments basically. They had to watch documentaries or read articles or engage in a volunteer activity. And we came back together and we synthesized that information with them and we provided um, experiences where they could meet other professionals working in environmental fields, where they could ask questions to us uh, as educators and we had a great turnout. We had about 10 kids who signed up. Uh, we had five who finished with us and three others who finished uh, outside of that experience with us. This was actually toward the end of summer, and so some of the youth had to go back to school, so we let them finish extra virtually, I guess. <laughs> they did their homework and put things into us later. Um, but at the conclusion, all the youth were asked to complete a volunteer project. Um, normally, what we would do in a, pro in a situation like this is we would ask the youth to lead a volunteer project, but because we wanted to maintain social distancing, we encouraged them just to do the project on their own, maybe involving some people who live in their home with them. And so one of our youth, Reagan, uh, decided that she wanted to clean up the streets in her neighborhood. Uh, and so she did that with her family, and she recycled all the material she could. But then she also decided that there were a lot of things that could be composted. So she actually went around and collected all those compostable materials and um, developed a compost bin in her own backyard so that she could turn that 
uh, material into soil for her garden next spring, which was really cool. She also shared with us a number of her, her walks with her family. Um, so she decided that she was going to use this environmental food club to get her family more active, and they went out on walks every weekend. And so she made them go with her to Red River Gorge and to Austin Hills, and she actually shared those photos with us. And so I thought that was a really cool thing to share, that the club motivated her to get her family more active in their community. Um, I'd love to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to share these experiences with you today. This virtual model was really interesting, and it's been a lot of fun. And so I look forward to continuing to serve our youth with this um, engagement model, and then again in person as soon as we can. So thank you. Thank you, Sue and Tony, for sharing information about Ohio 4-H spin clubs. It was very interesting. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Clark, Kirk Bloor, State 4-H leader, for some closing remarks before we open it up for questions. Since we are opening up for questions, you may enter, enter your questions in the Q&A box it's at the bottom of your screen. Kirk? Thanks, Elizabeth. You know, it's been my pleasure to be with you this afternoon to hear a few examples of the ways that our Ohio 4-H professionals, volunteers, have worked together to create opportunities for virtual innovation and determination. So if you put those uh, beginning letters together, COVID has uh, thrown us a curveball for sure, and I've been talking about it as a roller coaster that we've been riding for the past several months but it's also caused us to think about how it is that we're able to achieve our mission of developing youth in the best ways that we know possible. And we do that by continuing to engage them with caring adults that we work with from our communities, um, whether those are paid for each professionals themselves or the volunteers. And we do that because we have the fantastic support of donors, family, friends, volunteers, um, putting together our teen and adult volunteers across the state. We have more than 16,000 individuals who volunteer their time to help us reach more than 60,000 youth. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Kress shared earlier, we'd like to think of 4-H as the first class that those 61,000 kids uh, take at The Ohio State University. So we're a part of the Cornerstone College at The Ohio State University. We help achieve the land grant mission and to all of our longtime donors, our individuals, our corporate sponsors, our organizational partners, thank you for the contributions that you have given us that allow us to continue to build that next generation of true leaders. You know, they're really in a place where we continue to need our financial support to be able to engage even more youth across the state. So we have tremendous reach in our rural communities and our traditional community clubs uh, where we engage youth in those learn by doing, those hand-on learning that help them develop the skills that they need to lead for the lifetime. Our hands-on doing approach, I'd like to think that A.B. Graham, our 4-H founding father from uh, Clark County, would be very proud of the way that we've continued to innovate and use the technology tools of today to reach youth and help them develop those skills to turn their passion into purpose. And so I invite you all to continue to engage with us as we uh, work together to truly do the things that we find our passion around, which is building the skills in youth to be our replacements down the road. So thank you for coming together to be with us this afternoon to hear a few ways that we've worked to be creatively innovative to continue to engage across our geographic boundaries and to do the work that we call 4-H positive youth development. And so with that, uh, thank you. It's been a privilege for being with you. And at this time, we're going to uh, ask you if you have any questions to type them into the Q&A box. And while we're getting that turned on and our videos turned back on of our presenters, uh, questions that you may have for them, um, but also in, invite you to uh, continue to remain engaged with us. And so you'll um, likely be receiving more information about our virtual celebration of youth this year. It's our annual uh, fundraising event from the Ohio 4-H Foundation. Uh, this year, it's going to be on Thursday, November the 5th. And so I can check your email and uh, mailboxes uh, for more information that'll be coming about that pretty soon. So are there any questions that are showing up in the, the Q&A? And I believe Crystal's going to uh, read those out and moderate this next session for us. 
Thank you, Kirk. Yeah, so we have a couple questions and feel free to continue to adding them. So the first ones are for Kayla and Jamie. So what is something that you think will continue into 2021 and beyond based on the virtual experiences that you were able to complete this year? So I would share that we had a similar observation to what Kayla said here when we did our, our virtual camp in Muskingum County that our first year members or those kids that had not been to camp before were particularly receptive to the, the opportunity to see what camp, a little bit of what camp was like in the virtual format. So we, we tried hard to incorporate some of our, our regular camp traditions. And what we talked about as a, as a team afterwards with my volunteers and camp counselors was that we felt we could take that and turn it into a promotional opportunity for future camps, even face-to-face -face camps. So that would be potentially having an open house of sorts or a meet the counselors night for our uh, particular, maybe our, our younger campers or even our older campers to, to log on to Zoom from home. They wouldn't have to drive to a particular location, um, you know, to have that opportunity to participate in some of those activities, maybe see some photos of what camp looks like or hear about some of those activities. So I think that's something that we one way or the other are looking to implement in the future in Muskingum County. And I actually have plans to share that idea with uh, colleagues from around the state at the upcoming um, state camp director in service, which takes place in November. So I'm planning to share that outline or that opportunity with, with others and hope that maybe they'll implement that as well. And I, so I see that could be something that could definitely continue. Thanks, Jamie. Would you like to add anything, Kayla? I, I think the opportunity to do a virtual camp tour so that families, both campers and parents, can recognize what the facility looks like, what their experience will be. A lot of our campers might not have the opportunity to bring uh, a camera with them when they go to camp, and so if they want to tell their parents what they saw or what they did, doing a virtual camp tour before they go to camp allows the parent maybe to feel more comfortable of like, oh, when you said you went swimming, you were in a pool, or you were in this lake, or um, also recognizing what kind of their what their cabin looked like. Obviously the imagination and the description that a camper might give might be a little different than the expectations that the parent is drawing in their mind. So I think um, Jamie is spot on with that. That's a great idea that many of us are taking and want to do a virtual introduction to camps in the future. Wonderful. Thank you both. So the next question is actually for any of our panelists. What was your most interesting insight or observation that came from working in these new ways through COVID-19? For me, it was out of my comfort zone very quickly <laughs> because I knew I wanted to continue to offer youth opportunities, but you know, how to do that. So, some of my colleagues thought of very creative ways to uh, engage in the w virtual world. And I'm going to let Tony uh, take it over from here. But, but some of those were scavenger hunts so that they could create with this at the same time. They would scavenge for materials. Tony, I'll let you take it away. Well, I just wanted to say, like, obviously, the diversity of um, the skills that our educators have, that was quite a, quite a shock. Everybody's got so many different skill sets. Um, but what I found the most interesting was that we were in, in the spin clubs that I've worked with, half of the youth have not been involved in 4-H before. And so this was a very new way to reach new audiences, which Sue and I have both talked about how important that is for us working in urban environments, like that's a big deal, because there are a lot of kids who are not getting to engage in our programs for a variety of different reasons. And this has opened them up to um, understanding more of what 4-H is, giving them a chance to get that entry point into our system and an experience that hands-on learning, even though it's been virtual, they've been doing a lot of hands-on learning, which is really important. And so that's been the most interesting insight is we've been able to serve new audiences um, in new ways. And, and I think that's a really good thing. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. So this question might also be geared to more of the spin clubs, but maybe it could be either. Um, what examples do you have where public schools cooperate well with Ohio 4-H? 
Um, I can kind of. So I've been thinking a lot of how, and I know other um, 4-H professionals have too, how are we going to offer that to schools? And sometimes it's hard to have special interest programs until the spring when they get past all the things they need to do. But I know some of us are developing ways to align um, our, our virtual programming more with the standards they need to meet and then offer it to them so that will be that extra voice when they're maybe tired of teaching virtually. So I know I, myself, I've already um, contact, I've already formed a team with the, the Columbus City Schools um, gardening uh, and wellness coordinator um, to bring a program. So uh, I'm working on that now. So, and I know there are others also thinking in the same way. Absolutely. So I'm going to go back to our so, camping friends here. Or did you have something else you want to add first, Tony? <laughs> well, I just want to say I um, actually had a wonderful meeting this morning with Cincinnati Public Schools about formalizing the relationship that 4-H has been engaging in uh, with the various public schools. So in Cincinnati, we've been working really hard on a coordinated plan with all of the partners who do this type of work, this youth outreach, especially in the world of um, you know, food, agriculture, environmental sciences. And um, in Cincinnati Public, they're really looking at what grade level, what partners actually can, can target and how we can build that into their curriculum because we've offered these experiences for so long. We have a robust history with them. Uh, obviously, we're Ohio State University, so they trust us. And so how can we actually formalize that relationship and say, for example, one of the things that's thrown out there is every third grader in Cincinnati Public School does chick quest, you know, that kind of thing. So they're, they're, there's a reciprocal relationship here, and they're really looking at formalizing that. And I think once we get those big school districts like Columbus and Cincinnati or Cleveland to engage in that formal way, I think it's going to, um, the dominoes are going to fall, and it's going to make it really easy for everyone to say, oh, wow, 4-H is amazing. We all want to be a part of this great system. Absolutely. So actually, I'm going to ask one more question related to that since it's connected, and we'll close then with our camping question. Um, how many of these great examples that you've shared today more widespread through Ohio? I would love to see my community to become more aware and take part in these great opportunities of more positive youth development. That might be more Tony or Sue as far as the spin clumps, but I think that could be open to any of our presenters. Tony, I'll let you take it. <laughs> well, so you know, Cincinnati is a unique case because we have not had a super strong 4-H program in the traditional sense, but our non-traditional programs or the things we've done in the schools or through community partners has been really strong for, for about six years now. And so as we do spin club programs, um, as we offer these opportunities to develop curriculum and we work with new partners, uh, we look at those partners that would also exist in other counties. So um, because I have experience from when I used to live in Clinton County, I always use them as my by example, but I'm in Hamilton County now, and I'm partnering with the Educational Service Center, and they're doing different things with us around food security. There's an Educational Service Center also in Clinton County. Actually, it's our small four counties there. So, you know, that's a relationship that is working here. Can it work there? How can we translate that information into another county? And so we're looking at those things. As we partner uh, with the Farm Bureau, the Farm Bureau exists in every county in Ohio. What are they doing in Sprinkling County that we can also do in Hamilton County, that they can also do in Lucas County, that they can also do in Trumbull County? Um, you know, we have those traditional partners and we can, we can spread that relationship across multiple counties and it's, it's a really great way to engage new audiences. But the Spin Club model is so great because as we engage with youth, we are bound by counties. Um, even though we're uh, funded by county commissioners and we do everything, you know, kind of on that county line, these virtual programs are open. And people can join you from other counties. They can meet new people and they can engage in new projects. So, you know, how can you get engaged in these things, partner with new partners, and be a part of those spin clubs when they get advertised? Absolutely. I would like to say that I discovered that with Bird Polar. And now because of that partnership mm -hmm. I had with them, um, even today I had an email from another partner, at a potential partner at Ohio State. So others want to get on the bandwagon and we have the platform and they want to help spread the word about their particular scientific topic or whatever the case may be uh, with us as partners. Thank you both. 
So in the interest of time, this is our last question. So I'm going to direct this to Kayla and Jamie. But do you have any reflections from the campers this year that you could share with us? Yes, I would like to share. I had to pull up the notes that were taken from the chat box at the Ohio 4-H Leadership Camp. We asked our teens, what surprised you about the virtual camp setting? And some of the responses that came in were that even though it's online, it's still fun. I'm still able to create connections with others. That I'm making bonds and new friendships. How great the technology has been working and my fingers crossed that it remains. <laughs> and also a response of how smoothly everything is running and how supportive our other campers have been. And that note came from one of our, our camp counselors who is a college student was recognizing that in the chat box, campers were able to engage a little bit more than they might have in person instead of being able to speak out loud and say, that was a really great idea that you shared in our group. They were typing in and they were always very positive and encouraging. And those are little things that we don't always see or hear when we're in in-person camp, but when it's in a shared chat box, it's for all of us to see. So that insight was really great. The last thing I would share is the reflection activity that I've done at two different camps, leadership camp and Ohio military kids camp, where right now we're on Zoom and I can see people's faces. We would have people shut their videos off so it was just their names. One person would come on and turn on a flashlight or a lantern, or maybe it was even the light on their cell phone. And we're replicating a candle lighting experience that would happen at camp. And they would turn on their light and they would say their name, where they were from, and what they enjoyed about camp. And then they would say, I'm sharing my light with Jamie. And then Jamie would turn on her video and hold up her light. And then throughout all of it, between the 30 to 50 campers or staff who were online, it slowly filled the screen with everybody and sharing their positive light. And it just, it gives me goosebumps to think about it. But knowing that positive reflection was the, the capstone to closing off camp was really great. Thank you, Kayla. That's a beautiful story. So with now, I'm going to turn it back over to Elizabeth with closing remarks. Yes, thank you, Kayla, Susan, Jamie, and Tony for all the work that you've done in this virtual, crazy, you know, COVID-19 environment. You are really a, a good example of leadership for positive youth development. And once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Your support of Ohio 4-H makes these programs possible. As we said before, earlier in the program, you are going to receive an email of this recording sometime this week or next week. So once again, I thank you for attending. I want you to stay healthy, take care, and have a wonderful weekend.